So we got Rich Cabrera from Ready Player Dow, and uh, you guys come on out. Uh, and we've got uh, uh, Onblocks as well here today. So thank you, thank you. Why don't you guys go ahead and uh, have a seat? And thank you so much. And Grant Hasley as well. Thank you. All right. So we got a, a few people that are late, but we're going to talk about Undead Blocks for now, huh? Well, we can talk about Ready Player Now too, of course. We can, we can shoot it back and forth. So yeah, let's just do intros. So I'm Rich Cabrera, Ready Player Rich on Twitter. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Ready Player DAO. We are Web3 Gaming uh, DAO. So we're focused on uh, Web3 Gaming, Web3 Gaming infrastructure, building Web3 Gaming communities, uh, esports content marketing. And of course, the people that we're looking at to hang out with and to play around with are the guys that are making the games as well which is why we got Grant here. So why don't you tell us about Undead Blocks and let's say Kill Turn? Hashtag Kill Turn, kill zombies are in crypto. But guys, thanks for coming. My name is Grant Hasley. I'm the executive director, founder of Undead Blocks. So we're the world's first play to earn FPS shooter on the Ethereum blockchain. We're really excited to bring this game to you guys. Our beta is fully live. And so, you know, if we're talking about just straight play to earn, I truly believe there are two factions of play to earn right now. You have these web-based, uh, games that frankly in my opinion are decentralized yield farming they're not really fun they're not really engaging i wouldn't even call them a game at all and then from the other side of the spectrum you have these quote unquote triple a gaming studios that tout they, they sell nfts they raise token and they frankly don't deliver a fun or intriguing experience at all most of the time it's either just a teaser trailer or a game that they didn't even uh, you know, start promoting until three months before uh, before mm -hmm. launch. So from our perspective, uh, we're in a really good spot. The Undead Blocks okay. beta is fully live. If you guys are into Call of Duty, Call of Duty Zombies, uh, you can go play the game right now. Check it out. I want you guys to give us feedback. Really excited to be here, and thanks for having me. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think you're referencing, like, the game five stuff, uh, which I don't find very intriguing. Yeah. Either we like to see more engaging gameplay uh, and then creative ways that we're thinking about how to incorporate NFTs and tokenomics into those, right? And we got Dylan. Thanks for thanks for showing up, making the, making an appearance. <laughs> Better late than never. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're digging into Undead a little bit. Um, you mentioned Call of Duty. Uh, you mentioned Zombies. Uh, I think most people know all about that. Uh, what's the lore behind Undead Blocks? Is it also, you know, World War II era? What's the story? How did zombies come yes. to be? Yes. So I, I'll preface this by saying I believe, I mean, we chose zombies as a culture or as a uh, uh, genre because you don't have to speak a language to get into zombies. Zombies as a culture is worldwide. Uh, you're looking at games like uh, Call of Duty Zombies, like you said, 15 years, 32 maps for their first iteration of that game. We have some serious staying power here, whether it's Left 4 Dead, that's historically known as one of the most uh, fun uh, zombie shooters of all time. Even just in gaming, or uh, sorry, in movies like World War Z, uh, th this is lots of staying power here. So from our perspective, we wanted to actually set on that box in the future. That's where we're moving, right? The metaverse is going to be set in the future, but we can also expand and show you guys exactly how we're going to be incorporating NFTs in our game, whether that's other profile picture projects, other games, we can put skins in the, in the game to show um, that we are not just building our own lore. We really want to take lore from other franchises and wrap them all up in Undead Blocks. Awesome. So I, I want to pause and introduce Dylan and, and David as well, and then talk a little bit more high level about Web3 Gaming and the general space. But Dylan, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, uh, Dylan Bushnell, VP of Games uh, at uh, Atmos Labs. We are building uh, uh, XOGP, which is a flight-based uh, racing game um, with a competitive multiplayer, a, uh, a really in-depth fabrication and customization system, um, and some yeah, some badass lore. All right, we're going to have to dig into that a little bit later. Too. Yeah. David? Uh, hey guys, sorry for being late. David Chin. Uh, I am based in Singapore. I'm the global head of adoption for uh, Layer 1 blockchain called Clayton. We are effectively the only Layer 1 in Korea now uh, and effectively the only real Layer 1 left in Asia. Our focus is in on gaming use cases as well as entertainment. Yeah, so just talking on the broader market, um, we're going to address the bear in the room or I meant the elephant in the room, but it is the bear in the room, right? <laughs> uh, how do we envision the, the bear and, you know, 
potentially some change in sentiment around player and gaming and some of the, I guess, not as, uh, you know, well thought out approaches to tokenomics. Um, how are we thinking about those impacts to Web3 gaming? Um, and how are you guys looking at changing that messaging? You know, I think, um, I think bear markets are some of the best times to build overall, right? Um, I think, yeah, I think that's kind of like the, the short answer there. Um, and then, yeah, on the, on the game side, it's really about um, just elevating experience, you know? And there's, um, there's, there's plenty of, of systems and economic layers that can be placed over that, but you know, so long as you're just trying to deliver something uh, that people will enjoy and that's awesome and that gives some new, you know, new gameplay utility, new experiences, um, then I think you can weather any storm. I, for us, I mean, I, you know, we're, we'd like to see more gaming communities using uh, rewards, NFT rewards, uh, to build membership with community. I love that. Rather than creating gaming assets um, and really just having greed kick in, right? I think this is where the whole bump, uh, pump and dump thing happens. If you have rewards and you're contributing to that gaming community, then using those rewards to stake into the games that you want to play and uh, creating more, less of a play to earn and more of a compete to earn type of environment. So that, that's where we would like to see gaming go. We're looking at projects that uh, are, are starting to develop these concepts. Um, so yeah, that's, that's for us. And, and from our perspective, I look at it as, I think you should play to have fun and then compete to win big. I think traditional play to earn, you're looking at games like Axie, Thetan Arena, Peg Axie, you know, we wouldn't be on the stage without them if we're talking about strictly play to earn. But at the end of the day, those communities, um, you know, they stopped earning because of that manipulation of that secondary reward currency. When it goes to zero, essentially your community is going to say, I don't care what we do, we just want to be able to earn. So from our perspective, shifting the paradigm from pointing and clicking and being able to earn, essentially decentralized yield farming, to can you compete and have fun, but also have the opportunity to win big, whether that's through an NFT collection, whether that's through a, a, a esports tournament, just being able to switch the paradigm and shift it to, to play to have fun, but there is going to be rewards for those who really want to be a member of the community. Yeah, so I'm, I think I'm hearing less of uh, being rewarded for just playing the game, more of earning those rewards through playing the game, right? So. I think that's a lot of what we see in Web2 games, right? Um, but there, you're not really rewarded with anything of value, and you don't really have ownership of the, over those assets that you're being rewarded, right? So that's, that's the key differentiator and like the key value add that we're getting from Web3 gaming. Uh, and and like, like you guys are saying, I think we're seeing a lot more people moving towards that model. And it's more of like, you know, if you're a top player, um, and you're, you're committed and, and driven and um, are driving value back to those games and those ecosystems, then you're gonna earn some rare assets, you're gonna earn some cool stuff, and that's gonna inherently have value because not everybody is, is getting a lot of those, right? Uh, and then beyond that, there's gonna be you know, new tokenomic models that are gonna be a little bit more sustainable and more hybrid rather than those, those open um, economic models that we've seen in the past. Yeah, just, uh, I think, you know, there's there's so many different player motivations and and reasons people play different games and different and and uh, and focus on certain parts of those games, right? I think a lot of the um, uh, blockchain gaming we've really gotten the you know the the collector aspect, right? Like that's yeah. it's pretty one for one, you know. Um, so we've really dug in on that, and I think the the really next wave of um, blockchain enabled games will be about horizontal integration, getting in, you know, capturing other player motivations effectively. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's uh, a topic that I really love because uh, there's a lot of different personalities in gaming, right? So like the way you guys play a game versus the way I play a game is, is very different, right? Just because we're different as an individual, right? So some people are looking for the flashy assets, some people are looking for the rare assets, some people are working for um, just loving the strategy of the game itself, right? So you, you have to be able to reward uh, and have those kind of experiences for the different uh, player personality traits, right? And those different player personality styles. The same as like the way you guys interact and, and spend your money in Web2 is similar to how you're gonna spend your tokens that you earn in, in Web3 games, right? So thinking that, taking that approach 
uh, into tokenomics is something that I'm excited to see rather than to just like play and, and take the token and then, you know. Huzzah. Yeah, exactly. So, well, Dave, David said this yesterday in our, in our pre-discussion where right now NFT gaming is being recruited to the same individuals, these group of individuals. They're all collecting these different, uh, whether it's PFPs or uh, land, in our case, at Undead Blocks weapons. And so we have to get outside of our comfort zone. And how do you actually recruit to these Web2 gamers that are doing something like Call of Duty where they're playing for six, seven, eight hours a day? They love it. They even pay for the right to have their skins and they don't even own it because they can't sell it on a secondary marketplace. How do we bridge this gap? And to me, that answer is make it as easy and as smooth. We have have to stop talking about tokenomics. We have to stop talking about wallet integrations. We have to make fun games and we have to make them so accessible for people that we are essentially just making ourselves known that we are going to be the bridge from web two to web three. I, I agree. I think portability is the key in driving residual value. So I'm, I'm not, I, you know, I, I agree with what he was saying. I think we need more horizontal integration and we've got to figure out how to solve for that. I don't think we necessarily see to, need to see more incredible games. Like, that would be great. But if we had to kind of prioritize resources, I would rather see infrastructure creating portability across in-game cosmetics. And uh, the platform for that is, is doing it on-chain. My view is, you know, the NFT asset is the enabler for that. Um, and my view is EVM compatibility will drive pooled liquidity, which will make it more interesting for people. Uh, but yeah, the bottom line is it's portability to create that residual value outside of your game. Yeah, so um, you mentioned you guys are, are Asian-based, and I think we're North American-based, um, and we know those gaming scenes are very different. So I'd love to hear uh, more about what the Korean and Japanese and uh, Chinese scenes look like when it comes to gaming and how they're thinking about Web3 gaming. Are they excited about it? Are they, are they dialed in? So there's two camps. Um, the first camp is sort of Northeast Asia, which is more, I would say, I would call them more savvier gamers. Uh, and they've been doing it a lot longer. But they're also more geared towards um, desktop gaming, web-based gaming. Uh, although I would say China in particular has, we've seen a drastic shift towards mobile games. Um, on a broader macro level for the region, uh, there's a higher uh, percentage of conversion into mobile games these days. So it's moving away from the desktop. Um, so whenever I meet you know, gaming projects in Asia or abroad, I always ask them, if you don't have a mobile strategy, what is your strategy? Uh, because if you want penetration into Asia, you've got to have that strategy. Uh, but you know, I think most people know, uh, broadly speaking, Asia, the average person is really into gaming. They're also really into trading and investments. So Web3 gaming and looking at bringing assetization into the gaming industry is very natural for uh, people in Asia. Um, but it's very different because Southeast Asia is more emerging markets, so they like the play-to-earn model, whereas Northeast Asia is more developed, so it's, it's very different. And I think Northeast Asia would be a very good portion of the region for implementing things like compete to earn rather than play to earn. Yeah, and, and those are great points. It's, it's like very important to understand the market uh, and who your gamers are and what they're looking for, right? So I, I think that's, that's great. Um, so Dylan, you mentioned Atmos, and you like very briefly mentioned the game that you're building. Uh, I don't think we can leave on a, on a cliffhanger, so we're going to need some more information there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're, you know, there. Uh, uh, at its basis, right, it's a competitive flight-based racing game. Um, and, you know, outside of, of Web3, you know, games and just, just games in general, um, uh, flight-based racing games are pretty rare. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody's really figured that out quite right. Um, so we're really, you know, we're trying to, um, to replicate the, you know, the, the, the AAA driving game experience um, in, in three dimensions. Um, and, and also set that interface up such that uh, it can power other game modes as well, beyond just racing. Um, in addition to that, we've, uh, we've, we've built these suits in a, um, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that was really, um, you know, kind of taking the, the, um, the, the typical asset and character um, customization systems from uh, conventional games um, and, and, uh, and tweaking it with, um, with some of the asset 
mechanics that Web3 gamers are really um, used to breeding, right? Um, and the ability to mint new assets. So we've built this whole, uh, this whole flight suit that is extremely modular, um, and then we're augmenting that with a, uh, a fabrication system that basically allows players to fabricate new pieces of equipment that have you know, uh, different stat-based um, values, different aesthetic values, um, and yeah, and, uh, different rarities. Um, and, and that is uh, powered by a, a, a asset generation system, a, a resource generation system, uh, where, where players are mining uh, the materials to be able to craft those suit components to then go out and use them in different types of uh, game modes. How do suits breed? Sorry? How do suits breed? So it's, uh, <laughs> it's crafting. Uh, we, it, in, in our world, it's, it's fabrication, right? right. It, it has some of that, like, uh, you know, the, the mechanics of DNA. Um, so the, there's a bit of that in there, but, uh, but yeah, it's a crafting system. Oh, awesome. No, I'm just picking on you because you, you, mentioned, you mentioned breeding. Uh, it was part of why. I mean, I, I've been wanting to do a, uh, I mean, ever since CryptoKitties, right? Like, that's procedural art creation is, is awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I guess a question for both of you guys. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we saw the inflation mechanism of breeding, right? It's necessary to, to bring on more players if the game uh, is, is like token, token access, right? If you require an NFT to play the game, you need more NFTs to bring on more players. But uh, something we saw with Axie is uh, that also has an inflationary aspect to it. And then you got to reel that in. So how are you guys thinking about sinks uh, or a deflationary aspect to the other side of that? We have a, uh, we're experimenting and, 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 and building a bunch of different potential approaches. Uh, I, I would too not much, too confirm much alpha. those right now. <laughs> so from our perspective, we're under no pressure to mint more NFTs. Like for uh, those that don't know, like Undead Blocks, we're going to have 6,000 weapons. And so from our perspective, we want to have two factions in our game. We want these 6,000 people to be an elite fighting force that are always competing for prize pools, but then shifting the paradigm to that free-to-play, eventually emerging into an undead battle pass where you hold our governance token. A, it gives you say in decisions. B, it gives you exclusive access, whether that's challenges, quests, maybe potential tournaments. And so from our perspective, we do not want to dilute the value of our NFTs. Especially if you're in an investment or you're a venture capital fund out there looking to take a position in this, you don't want to make a large investment in an NFT collection just for them to dilute you. And like you said, more NFTs, that's more pressure, that's more essentially yield that you have to produce. That yield has to come from somewhere. We all joke, if you don't know where the yield is coming from, you are the yield. So from our perspective, it's generate revenue, use it to pay players, and make sure that the game is fun. So no more NFT to play, free to play. Well, I think from our perspective, you can have both, right? Like, there are, if you take the NBA as an example, you have 32 franchises, but if we went to 300 franchises, you're diluting the value of the entertainment brand on the floor. Sure, you get more cities involved, but are you, is it really worth the risk reward of diluting your product? Whereas if you do something like pick up basketball, I mean, everybody loves basketball in general. So that's the approach I take. We want to make sure that, um, from our perspective, we do not want to cut off people, though. When you're talking about mainstream adoption, making sure that we're not just recruiting to the same individuals that already have a MetaMask, from our perspective, you have to give them an entry point. And from, I'll give you an example. Ariana Grande did a concert in Fortnite. 27 and a half million people attended this concert. How many people are going to sign up in some of these emerging market countries where we're actually putting up a guaranteed prize pool uh, for them to be able to free, and, uh, free to play? So from our perspective, that's the approach we want to take in terms of mass adoption, make it so easy, so simple for them to do it, that it's an absolute no-brainer. I, I love this point. Yes. It's a, a, really the next generation is going to be about accessibility, effective onboarding, and just frictionless, uh, and moving towards that, totally. Awesome. Uh, easy Bucko just arrived. You want yeah. to yourself? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm Easy Bucko, I'm the co-founder of Pro League. Um, we're building on Solana to where we automate Web 2 and Web 3 uh, we're building a Web3 infrastructure for Web2 and Web3 games. Um, and we need an excuse uh, for your tardiness. Uh, I was in a meeting. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm just messing with you. Do you want to talk more about uh, Pro League and a little bit what, what's exciting you there and what's the, uh, the thesis for that? What are you um, guys working on? Mainly we're just solving like, problems in the payment infrastructure. You know, um, you know, like gamers don't get paid for 30 to 90 days. And, you know, we're, what we're doing is, like, instant cash-out capabilities, you know, the payment rails. For tournaments, right? Yep. Yeah. 
So you guys are building um, essentially a tournament platform on Solana, uh, and you guys are trying to solve the the payout gap for a lot of players. So correct. Instant pay, um, instant payouts for the uh, prize pools of those tournaments. Yes, correct. Uh, and you mentioned Solana, and uh, I asked you about this uh, when we met previously, but there's been a lot of, of issues with downtime and, and a few other things happening on Solana. How, what are your thoughts around that? Um, I, mean, I mean, if it keeps going down, like, it's going to fail um, by the end of the day. Like, it's still in beta. Um, so, you know, I trust, like, what Antoni and Raj is doing and, you know, with Rust. And, you know, it's a really great uh, program. Uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> program, develop or a language. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So um, I know we have a few minutes left. If uh, yeah, I, I, you know, just on that other topic, I you know, I'd love to hear from the guys what they think about the concept of uh, introducing nesting of NFTs into a game to create scarcity, right? Or you know, swap and burn, right? Um, I, I've seen this with collectibles. Um, so I hold a bunch of Street Fighter collectibles, NFTs that are um, on one of the uh, blockchains. And they have a similar program where they do something like that. Or, you know, I, I personally like the idea of introducing um, dynamic NFT technology into the uh, assets that are in-game. So there is a method for it to change. And with that change, you have dynamic valuation, right? So it can either... People may not like it, and then they'll, you know, it, it'll lower in value, or people may like it and may go higher in value. But yeah, I would love to hear what the guys think about nesting NFTs to create scarcity, or their thoughts on dynamic NFTs and well, gaming. I could definitely touch on the changing of the metadata of the NFT. So, for example, on Dead Blocks, you're going to be able to upgrade your weapons. You're also going to be able to add scopes, uh, grenade launchers, these different features that they love. Uh, from you know OG COD Zombies players, you're also going to be able to pack a punch your weapon where it's actually changing the fuzzle rate, it's actually changing the flash when you shoot the weapon. So, And all of that will actually update the metadata of the NFT if you're looking at something on like OpenSea. So I do agree that it also puts players on a path. It puts them on an adventure. It's not about just how much can I earn from this game. It's, okay, now I'm having fun. I'm upgrading my assets. And in turn, those upgraded assets should hold more tangible value on a secondary market. Yeah, composability. That's actually something that I've, I've heard people talk about a lot, but I haven't seen much of it actually come into play. So definitely excited to see how that turns out in, in Undead Blocks. Um, one of the other things I want to ask about, and I think this affects everybody on the stage, is how we're seeing uh, Web3 guilds come to fruition and how it's affecting gameplay, how you guys are designing uh, your games. Are you designing with guilds in mind? Uh, how, what guilds look like in Asia, uh, or how you interact with guilds on the tournament side. So I, For us, we, we have a guild strategy, and what we're doing is we're working with some of the biggest esports teams that are out there. So one of them that I can talk about, which is public, is EVOS, which is the biggest esports team in Singapore, or in Southeast Asia, I should say. Um, and what we do with them is we talk to them about developing uh, guilds and then to bring in other esports teams and, and communities so that we can create this compete to earn environment. At that point, play to earn games are relevant, but not that relevant. Because you don't need the play to earn model to compete to earn. You can play a game that doesn't have that model and just win and win prizes, right? So it becomes a lot more interesting that way. But in order for us to achieve that, we, you know, we do want to bring on board um, the guys who have the experience in running these things, tournaments, competitions, and being a part of that. Um, and so, generally speaking, we're seeing a lot of interest. We're seeing another, uh, we spoke to another one here today from Latin America. We'll be speaking to another big one from the U.S. here. Um, and we're going to continue with that strategy because we think that will be, uh, that'll add value to the overall compete to earn model that we think will we'll win in the end. Just to, touching on David's point, I think guilds have come under fire recently. I think the reason is because nobody's earning right now in a lot of these games. And so they do have to make a pivot. But I'm going to sit up here and say I love guilds, what they're doing. They're helping these people, especially in third world emerging market countries, educating them about personal finance, educating them about financial independence, and educating them about crypto in general. And I do think that they're going to have to make that change. That's even why, from our perspective in Undead Blocks, by keeping a limited supply of NFTs, like David said, okay, 
for our PC and Mac version before we develop mobile, maybe we don't have you know, a lot of um, the, the dilution of the NFTs, but these guilds can send their most elite fighters, people that are into FPS, because they definitely exist. I think it's a slap in the face to someone in the Philippines to say they don't have a computer, they just have to play on the phone. So they're definitely out there, and it's just a matter of targeting those individuals, but also having a free-to-play option where people can really get onboarded. So. We're a... Uh... Uh, Atmos is, you know, the a next generation, you know, esport ultimately, right? Uh, and one of the biggest aspects of sports is this, um, you know, the sense of uh, of factionalism, of of teams, of micro communities within, right? And um, and people to develop their identity, uh, and uh, so so that's super important to us. Uh, and we're basically we're building guild functionality that um, play can be a you know a constant presence throughout the game, no matter which competitive bracket you're, you're, you're existing at, um, as well as then supplementing that with the league structure with it, which has more, um, uh, a, that, that is more closely, closely likened to the, the, the current competitive sports um, paradigm. Yep. And how are you seeing it in, uh, in tournaments? Um, well, with gaming guilds, like it brings whole new opportunities to everyone. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much like a web three, um, you know, or org, right? Where anyone can join, you know, and it gives it gives actually um, people uh, more opportunities, you know. Um, and what I love about gaming guilds is, is like, hey, they're very open instead of like orgs where you have to try out. And you know, not only do that, they provide revenue streams for the players. Yeah, um, yeah. So obviously, Ready Player DAO has a guild arm as well, um, and I, I think we. We had a few few of you guys mention esports, right? And I think that's the natural shift, right? I think with a lot more of these, uh, you know, stable tokenomic economies um, and more well thought out, uh, we're going to see a shift away from the play to earn guilds that are looking for returns, right? And we're going to start shifting towards uh, more esports and content focused uh, guilds and healthy, like. More like the Web2 guild communities that we, we've seen in the past with like World of Warcraft, right? Uh, groups of gamers, individuals looking to achieve a similar result on a game, right? Or just a really competitive uh, group of individuals as well, focused on one game, um, et cetera. So that's, that's also a route we're going. Um, but I know we're running up on, on time, so uh, if you guys have any, any closing statements, where can we follow you guys, keep up to date, et cetera? Uh, I'll start I'm Ready Player Rich. Uh, you can follow us at Ready Player DAO. Uh, we do Web3 Gaming and Web3 Gaming infrastructure investments. Uh, we advise on tokenomics, and of course, we have the guild and community aspect. And the mic will be on, don't yeah, so my name is Grant Tassley, Executive Director of Undead Blocks. You guys can find us on Twitter at Undead Blocks. What I want every single person in the audience to do is go to our website, undeadblocks.com. If you're into FPS gaming, you ever played a zombie shooter, our beta is fully functional, give us feedback, send it to me directly, grant underscore undead. It's just going to make us stronger. Thanks for having me. Uh, Dylan Bushnell, VP of Games at Atmos Labs. Uh, check out our, uh, follow us on Twitter at Atmos XYZ and our website uh, and join our Discord. Um, check out Kevin Beauregard's uh, speech later, later today. Uh, as well as Matt Rosax uh, from a couple days ago. So, yeah, you can find us at uh, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. We're on all medium. Um, our handle, I believe, is Clayton Official. Our website is uh, Clayton dot Foundation. Um, my personal handle is at Shin underscore Novation. Uh, so check us out. Yeah. So you know, Pro League dot GG. Um, you know, I'm Easy Bucko. Um, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you guys for uh, coming out today. Thanks, everybody, for having us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm actually really excited to uh, play Undead. I do a live stream every Thursday on Twitch, and we'll be playing Undead really? next Thursday. So thank you, guys. <laughs>